everyone, I hope you had a nice lunch. Um, so, um, we're in the home stretch, is that what you call it? I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say that and I was like, shit, that, um, I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, yeah, so we're in the final session um, of the summit. And we now have the great pleasure of uh, being joined by um, Isabel Millar. So Isabel is a philosopher and psychoanalytic theorist from London. Her f first book, The Psychoanalysis of Artificial Intelligence, was published in 2021 in the uh, Palgrave uh, Lacan series. Her next book, um, Patty Politics, is forthcoming with Bloomsbury. She is associate researcher at Newcastle University, Department of Philosophy, and faculty at uh, the Global Center for Advanced Studies. And uh, Isabel's um, talk is titled Post Facial. So over to um, Isabel. And let me just. <laughs> This is like the complete derangement of my. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like different layers. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, I know what I can do. I can just hide word. And instead, you just have the. Um, yeah, my uh, desktop as your. Can I move that a little bit away? Because I've got a paper on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, actually, I can just do this as well. I don't know where. can just do that. Thank you. Oh, is it still there? Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're going to have to have my. As your backdrop, you're going to have to have my deranged. Oh, I can't um, see what it is. Oh, that'll yeah. do. It's fine. It makes sense. It will work for you. And. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you for this invitation. And I really enjoyed the talks um, earlier today, if the people are still here who gave the talks, but um, I thought they were fantastic. And I hope this sort of builds a little bit on what you've been listening to and seeing um, this morning. And um, I'll do the obligatory philosopher's apology, which is that I don't have any visuals and um, it's going to be just textual, I'm afraid. Um, but I, I'll give you a little bit of context um, for what I will uh, talk to you about today, which is, um, of course, as Daniel said, my, my uh, first book was The Psychoanalysis of Artificial Intelligence, and it was a book that, well, it was a PhD thesis, so it had a sort of quite specific um, aim, which was to sort of try and uh, uh, articulate a specific question and draw together certain fields of research in, a, in a, as concise a way as I could, um, given the, the very large scope of such a question as the psychoanalysis of AI. And it was kind of motivated by the, the, the at the time, and of course even more now, the sort of um, explosion of interest in artificial intelligence, but yet the dearth of um, real sort of uh, philosophical, I, I th th feel and believe, um, interrogation of lots of the concepts and ideas around subjectivity, what human beings are, uh, sexuality, enjoyment, um, all of these uh, questions that psychoanalytic thinkers and also philosophical thinkers, but particularly psychoanalytic thinkers are so interested in, which is the body and enjoyment and how uh, those concepts are ones that are often overlooked when we come to think about very rarefied concepts such as thought or intelligence and these kinds of big um, concepts that are thrown around, particularly in AI discourse, as sort of self-explanatory, as if we all know what thinking is, we all know what um, intelligence is, we all know what knowledge is, but well, of course we don't. They're uh, concepts that have very long histories, genealogies, and they've changed throughout time. We still don't know what they are now, um, but particularly in the field of philosophy, what we're interested in is tracing concepts, tracing uh, very carefully where a particular idea came from, whether that be uh, etymologically or historically or culturally or politically, 
and then trying to see how uh, certain parts of those ideas become invisible and become part of a, a wider discourse that then um, gets uh, fed into other um, more systems of reification and you know the culture industry, uh, technology, capitalism, all of those things that we all understand so well. So, so the psychoanalysis of AI was interested in particularly this com configuration between uh, intelligence, the body, enjoyment, and all of those overlooked uh, um, concepts. And so part of that was sort of unpacking the concept of, of intelligence itself, but then also going on to try and think about <coughs> the relationship between um, sexuality and intelligence, the relationship um, between thinking and enjoyment. And so I went into quite a lot of sort of uh, film exploration to do that. And through this um, research, I became more and more interested in a lot of the political elements of that and the sort of biopolitical and necropolitical histories that um, go into how we um, govern bodies. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Foucault's work and Membe, uh, who talks about necropolitics, something that at the moment is extremely um, of, of uh, topical interest given the horrors that are currently unfolding in the world. So what I became very interested in is how at the moment the ways that we govern bodies, the ways that we govern enjoyment are sort of so um, accelerated and so um, augmented by our technologies that we almost have to start thinking about a different paradigm. So it's not just biopolitics anymore, it's not just the management of um, life, it's not just necropolitics anymore, it's not just the management of death, but pati politics, which from the Latin patio, to suffer, the management of suffering. And of course, you think, oh, suffering, well, what do you mean by that? Well, for psychoanalysis, suffering and enjoyment are basically two sides of the same coin. It's very difficult to discern what comes first uh, in, in, um, with these two concepts. And for a psychoanalytic approach to any thinking about uh, subjectivity or any thinking about thinking itself, we have to go to this sort of elemental idea of the human suffering body and the enjoying body and how that enjoying body is immersed in discourse networks, is immersed in symbolic systems which are apparent before they're even born but yet this sort of physical biological uh, entity is subjected to all of these other forces and we don't really have control over that yet we enter into this sort of subjectivity um, that is supposedly a free um, uh, plane of existence that we that we um, that we uh, enter into. So, what I'll do now is cut into my my paper, which is uh, it's coming. It's part of my book, and it's going to be um, part of the, the one of the ways I'm trying to unpack some of these questions of pati political, and the ways in which our bodies are sort of entrapped in some of these uh, systems and networks. Um, so, yes. So it's about the face, <coughs> and I've called it the post-facial because I think um, we're, we're so quick to, to think that we are beyond the human, we're past all of these um, earthly things to do with um, our mundane sort of everyday existence, but we often forget uh, the very basic evolutionary um, beginnings of, of some of these most obvious things. So what is a face? This thing which we believe most uniquely represents our identity is most belonging to us, yet which is simultaneously inscrutable to us most of the time, unless we're trapped narcissists like gazing in a mirror all day. Would it be more accurate to say that the face belongs entirely to the other? It's for and by the other, constituted in the field of the other. Being creatures of language, the face as our prime means of communication is the ultimate abstraction of signification. This rhapsodic collection of 42 muscles spread out over eyes, nose and mouth work in constant response to the battery of signifiers it encounters. No matter whether we're aware of it or not, our faces are speaking for us every minute of the day with or without words, sounds or expressions. But of course, faces didn't begin as communication machines. In a project for the terraforming research program at the Strelka Institute for Media, Architecture and Design, researchers M.C. Abbott, Maria Boy Gonzalez and Carl Olson present the project Peak Face, in which they state, 
the facial phase proposes that the terraforming has a period that has been dominated by the phase which began around the Cambrian explosion 541 million years ago and has lasted until now. The phase began as an evolutionary adaptation that collected sensory organs at the front ends of animals. From this perspective, the face is primarily a platform for changing the environment and only secondarily an index of human identity. Since the facial phase has a determinate starting date, we can anticipate that it's also going to end at some point in the future. It may even be that we're on the precipice of a post-facial phase of the terraforming, where synthetic, abiotic forms of intelligence become key agents of reshaping the surface of the Earth. Unquote. It's a fascinating project, which presents us with the proposition that we may have indeed reached peak face. And that the terraforming, which originally refers to the hypothetical process of deliberately modifying the atmosphere, temperature, surface, topography, or ecology of the planet, moon, or other body, to be similar to the environment to Earth, to make it habitable for humans to live on. But more specifically, the process of intelligence transforming its surroundings at the scale of the planet, that may be now taking a different direction. We might also turn to Bernard Stiegler's Techniques in Time to identify another evolutionary moment crucial to the development of the human face. That is the acquisition of erect posture. Following uh, paleoanthropologist Leroy Gorin, Stiegler remarks that contrary to the assumption that a straight line should be drawn between Homo sapiens via the Neanderthalians with the, quote, impressive anthropoid foursome of modern times, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, the orangutan and the gibbon, Quote, which is the or origin of the Neanderthal brain pan and turning point in human paleontology, we should look elsewhere. The determining archeo archaeological element, according to Leroy Grant, is not directly the development of the brain, but rather the feet. And the discovery of the Zinjanthropian, a man with a very small brain, not a super anthropoid with a large brain pan. This finding, according to Leroy Grant, necessitates a revision of the concept of the human being leading him to claim that, to some extent, cerebral development is a secondary criterion. Stiegler goes on to say, erect posture determines a new system of relations between these two poles of the anterior field. The freeing of the hand during locomotion is also that of the face of grasping functions. The hand will necessarily call for tools, movable organs. The tools of the hand will necessarily call for the language of the face. The brain obviously plays a role, but it's no longer directive. It is but a partial element of a total apparatus, even if the evolution of the apparatus tends towards the deployment of the cerebral cortex." Unquote. <clears throat> so here we begin to see how the dialectical relation is set up between tools for the hand and language for the face, which in turn Stiegler famously elaborates in his grand conceptualization of hominization, including memo techniques, exteriorization and grammatization in terms of a unique coupling with the outside qua epiphylogenetic vector that is qua the truth of the inside. Unquote. So in other words, when it comes to the face, not only are we dealing with the evolution of the human species, but we're dealing with the impossible question of locating the moment when the face became the vehicle for subjectivity per se. So uh, in this talk, I want to explore some aspects of the proposition of the post-facial. Can there ever be a post-facial era, or at least one we could comprehend? With reference to one of uh, Lacan's most famous refrains, just as the letter always arrives at its destination, the face always has an audience. In a sense, it can't exist without one, and vice versa. We, as audience, need a face to observe and respond to. It is for this reason that our own faces are usually so problematic for us. We never seem to be able to understand our own faces or reconcile their effects on other people. In seminar 10, Lacan asks us to imagine being in front of a female praying mantis and not knowing whether we are wearing the mask of a male or a female. Since the female devours the male after mating, the anxiety we experience is that of not knowing the desire of the other with respect to our own face. This is fundamentally the experience of anxiety of all human encounters. We can't know what animates the desire of the other, nor what it is in the, that the other sees in us. The face is a site of deception, both to others and to ourselves. What we appeal to, to for the truth, yet the locus of our most deeply buried thoughts. 
the effort we expend each day preventing the face from exposing us is taken for granted as part of the social contract. In the pornographic image of the usually female face, this anxiety is taken away. The desire is made obvious, unambiguous. The woman's face, usually, wants one thing and one thing only. There is no unconscious here, no thought even, just pure affect. It is the insertion of distance that makes the face assimilable. No longer the devouring face of the praying mantis, read mother, which comes in and out of view of the infant's gaze to satisfy or thwart demands, the pornographic face has only one meaning. It attempts to communicate nothing new. It always knows its audience and operates in a closed circuit of signifiers. It's no coincidence then that in an age of perpetual anxiety that the general trend in cosmetic surgery and facial modification shares much with the semiotics of the pornographic face. A diminution of facial muscular mobility brought about by Botox, which inhibits the many possible micro-expressions of the face, the augmentation of the lips to a state of permanent suction, and the standardization of features to limit, as far as possible, the polysemic nature of the female gaze. Take the procession of brilliant, white, perfectly even tombstone smiles offered by modern dentistry, which often appear to take flight from the mouths of their owners, somewhat like the Cheshire Cat. The enigmatic fascination of the Mona Lisa smile is no longer coveted. This new smile means the same thing for whoever wears it. Today, the demand is for a permanently youthful face, frozen not just in time, but in the movement of the thought. A face which can enjoy, but cannot think. This must be opposed to the archetype of the male face, which thinks, but should not be seen to enjoy. The face is an existential black hole, both surface and depth. But while we used to fall in love with a beautiful image, on the usually misguided understanding that what lies beneath is even more fascinating, now the face is an essentially voyeuristic function, both something to be looked at from afar and protected behind a screen. What lies beneath is no longer of interest, or at least assumed to be already on the surface. So what of the singularity of the face? How is the face to be located as a site of subjection and freedom? And I've written about it elsewhere in... Um, uh, blondes, preliminary materials for a theory of the bombshell, and I'll briefly refer to it here. The face, according to Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, in the chapter entitled Year Zero Faciality, is a semiotic system consisting of the white wall and the black hole, or subjectification and signifiance, they call it. According to Deleuze and Guattari, the face is a product of signifying regimes. They ask, when does the abstract machine of faciality enter into play? When is it triggered? Take some examples. The maternal power operating through the face during nursing. The passional power operating through the face of a loved one, even in caresses. The political power operating through the face of the leader. The power of film operating through the face of the star and the close-up. Unquote. Counterintuitively, they argue for a concept of faciality as that which is inhuman on the human body. In fact, they say that the face is not even part of the human body, unlike the head. They say it would be an error to proceed as if the face only became inhuman beyond a certain threshold. Close-up, extreme magnification, recondite expression, etc. The inhuman in human beings, that is what the face is from the start. It is by nature a close-up. Unquote. This is why in primitive societies, note the anthropological thrust, the head was more privileged than the face, hence the use of masks and other headgear that obscured the facial features. Furthermore, they argue that faciality extends beyond the face and can take up and overcode the whole body or parts of it. They say that the entire body can be facialized, comes to be facialized as part of an inevitable process. When the mouth and nose, but first the eyes, become a holy surface, all other volumes and cavities of the body follow an operation worthy of Dr. Moreau, horrible and magnificent. Hand, breast, stomach, penis and vagina, thigh, leg and foot all come to be facialized. Fetishism, erotomania, all are inseparable from these processes of facialization. Unquote. The abstract machine of the face, as they put it, is made up then of these two poles, the white wall and the black hole. And they also represent the semiotic systems of significance and subjectification, which they 
famously elaborate in relation to their body without organs. So signifiance is never without a white wall which inscribes its signs and redundancies. Subjectification is never without a black hole in which it lodges its consciousness, passion and redundancies. Since all semiotics are mixed and strata comes in at least twos, it should come as no surprise that a very special mechanism is situated at the intersection. Oddly enough, it is a face, they say, the white wall black hole system. A broad face with white cheeks, chalk face with eyes cut out for a black hole, clown head, white clown, moon white mime, angel of death, holy shroud. Quote. So this conception of the face as signifying regime, they eventually want to dismantle, urging us to escape the face. Aside from its foundation as the index upon which racism and sexism are built, i.e. the degree to which any given faith differs from the archetypal or sacrificial face, that of Jesus Christ in their opinion, Deleuze and Guattari seem to want to evade the oppressive function of faciality. But as with many Deleuze and Guattari concepts, there appears always to be this potential for misapprehension or ambivalence, um, which is one way of looking at the desire for the standardisation of the face so prevalent today a way to escape the singularity of the face, perhaps the anxiety-provoking state of affairs which addresses us to the enigma of the other's desire. If we can circumscribe the possible interpretations of our face, then at least we can minimise the possibility of it inducing disapproval, disgust, horror or rage in the other. Another way to interpret uh, Deleuze and Guattari's proposition would be as a particularly masculine viewpoint. In other words, it's easier for a male subject to demand that we escape the face as they've never really been the victims or accomplices of their own faces in the way that women typically are. Men can historically be anonymous facially in a way that a woman never can. Women must be valid ethical subjects despite their facial conditions, young, old, beautiful, ugly, and this is to say nothing of the racial dimensions of these aspects. Any of those qualifiers either helping or hindering her but never indifferent to her success, happiness, virtue, or moral worth. In this sense, a woman is only ever perceived as her collection of adjectives, which she, of course, knows is not her, whereas for a man, the gap between those descriptors and himself as subject is sutured shut. What he believes he is, he is. Uh, this is what leads me to conclude that the, um, the bombshell, as exemplified in the trajectory from Marilyn Monroe to Kim Kardashian, should be metaphorised into the passage from the beauty spot above the mouth to the full probe head balaclava that uh, Kim Kardashian wore at the, the Met Ball. Beauty eats itself like a black hole. So what is the function of the face now? If the addressee of our faces is no longer another human being, but rather a collection of algorithms which scan our features for certain vectors of likability or consumability, is it in our interest to confuse or disappoint the audience? it would now seem almost unnecessary that the face as abstracted aesthetic image need to have any connection to its organic evolutionary features. The bilaterian creature who sprang from the Cambrian explosion is one whose existence has been propelled by the forward-facing symmetry most amenable to the survival of the, organisms, of the organism. The light, the eyes as light receptors, the mouth as energy consumption and conversion, and the nose as respiratory entrance does no longer need to have any relation to efficacy in order to be beautiful. In fact, it would make sense that these functions be taken up by another part of the body less devoted to the function of communication. But how strange that we should eat, talk and kiss with the same orifice. It's the proximity of a face in its multiple roles as consuming, communicating and caressing that can be so monstrous for us to encounter. All the easier to abstract the image from the flesh through the aesthetic dimension of fantasy the face on screen is so much less terrifying than the face close up, a face that can look back at us and make us shrivel and cringe with Sartrean self-consciousness. As Lacan pointed out, beauty is a defence against the real. And this is not just to be understood as the real of what lies beneath, as a horrific material mass of muscle, sinew, bone and flesh, but the real as impossible, the impossible place where materiality passes over to abstract signification. Where the mouth is both the seductive object of communication and the abyssal entrance to inner and infinite space, why else is pornography so obsessed by traversing the transitional space of the mouth? It's something to do 
with a passing over from materiality to transcendence, which happens via the eroticization of the body. But isn't it precisely this nexus of ambivalence and abjection represented by the face as a site of multiple functions, which is the point and the reason why it may not be so easy to slide into the post-faced era? More specifically, the face is not just a site of multiple functions, but simultaneous ontological planes, or in Badurian terms, truth procedures. The human face can, be both, can both operate as a purely biological entity, breathing, eating, seeing, hearing if you include the ears, whilst at the same time operate as an abstraction machine, signifying, interpreting, desiring, symbolising. In this sense, there are parallel truth procedures at play. The temporal and historical, which affirms the body as mortal and living, and the atemporal and aesthetic, which affirms the subject as undead and enjoying. <coughs> Another way to understand the significance of these distinctions is in response to a question often posed regarding the possibility of subjectivity in inhuman or artificially intelligent life, which is to say that the subject emerges not via the positing of intelligence, a property which can be attributed to various non-human entities, but rather the juxtaposition of a body in language, sentience. This gives rise to the paradoxical state of affairs that allows the face as abstraction machine to be perceived in any number of inanimate objects throughout the galaxy, which find themselves imbued with signification. As biological organisms born into language, we become symbolic entities by virtue of having to speak. That's to say we gain, or better still, appropriate our body, which counterintuitively is a completely symbolic object via the mediation of language. It's through the conversion of material bodily utterances into immaterial signs that we become human. The infant scream eventually becomes a word which can never again capture the immediacy of its original meaning. Something is lost, but crucially, it's a loss which was never there in the first place, a process which is only ever retroactive. One can never retrieve the moment before the symbolic hit, given that the symbolic is that which allows us to make intelligible the notion of the pre-symbolic, extra-linguistic dimension of human existence. The face operates as this moibus point of encounter, this diachronic moment. Edward Munch's scream is often thought of as capturing the anxiety of the human condition, but in its portrayal of the most basic facial form, it seems to signify not just the pure animal scream of man in nature, but rather something stranger, the recognition by nature of the fact of its humanisation. Munk famously said of the painting, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly, the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned on the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue-black black fjord and the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. Unquote. In other words, nature itself becomes facialized, trapped in signification. Unlike the baby who screams because it's not yet able to speak, Munch's scream of nature arises from the horror of discourse, the inescapability of signification which traverses nature and abstracts it from itself, what Lacan would call the second death, the death which occurs paradoxically before the death in reality. The second death is the entrance of the living body into the dead realm of the symbolic, forever severing it from the immediacy of the body in space and setting up the infinite and unquenchable cycle of the drive body. Words spilling out from mouths, meanings forever trying to catch up with the utterance from which they emanated. It's rather less than about the face being taken over and made standard by the non-human and more about the face as a concept which has taken over the non-human and overdetermined it. Those clever little eyes which allowed us to seek out light from the sun now become the scopic drive whose gaze is turned back a million fold on the sun and the universe beyond it. This formalised panoptic gaze which attempts to see everything from all angles and perspectives at once. The oral drive of the earth consuming everything in its path and the invocatory drive of the sonar plane which interprets and the enigmatic signifies all around it. The earth is one big face addressing an enigmatic other. It appears then that what we have 
are several distinct notions of faciality at stake here. Notions which have their corollary in differing concepts of intelligence. In terms of the proposition of the terraforming moment of peak face and our now potentially post-facial era, we could call this the instrumental face, a product of instrumental intelligence, one which follows an evolutionary trajectory and passes through time in a linear chronology, what we could call deep time as well. The second notion of faciality that conceived of by Deleuze and Guattari then is the political face, a product of political intelligence. This is properly speaking the historical face of human time, a face which ultimately strives for resistance and escape, striving towards the notions of the commons and the community. The third form of faciality, and the one which I think is perhaps the only way we can conceive of the face in relation to a notion of the contemporary subject, is what we could call the aesthetic face, a product of aesthetic intelligence. And here we're dealing with a temporal dimension particular to the time of the subject, and that is retroactivity, or mobus time. And the aesthetic face, just like the coming into being of a subject, short circuits time. And that's where I'm going to finish. Does anyone have any questions? I just want to jump right in and say I really enjoyed the paper. I um, thought it was really interesting. I love the mood from post, some from preface to peak face to post face. It made me realise that I was kind of waiting for you to drop it in your list and it didn't come up. So, what about the interface as a, like an operative concept in your typology of face? Um, and in particular, like the way you set up the concept of face and the way you describe the way you work with concepts at the beginning, it felt like the concept of interface might become redundant because the interface being the thing which lies between um, two subjects or itself and other or whatever, um, is already, that function is already adopted by any face. So what's the role of the interface? Because it seems to come up all the time. It was coming up a lot yesterday mm -hmm. as well. and. Does it belong somewhere between also preface and postface? Could it be like a machinic equivalent for this kind of like interfacial period? Mm. That's a really interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about the interface is that it's sort of um, tactile as well in a way. Like it's immediately invokes the hands, so it, Im it immediately kind of changes the dynamics of what we're talking about when we're talking about a face because um, you already sort of exteriorizing the, the certain parts of your um, body in order to do tasks that typically would be done by your face. So, I mean, I'm just thinking about immediately the idea of everybody, oh, children um, learning with uh, iPads in a way that they never did a few decades ago. Uh, so they... The, some of the, funct the primary functions um, of learning are already taken up by the brain and the body in quite a different way. So, in a sense, it is an interface, is a sort of interim concept as well, because it's sort of um, cutting in to this uh, evolutionary process or the sort of developmental process of the child in language. And I, I mean, it's not just children, of course, but it made me think of that because there was that hysteria about children with iPads and everyone worrying that they were going to become psychotic. In this psychoanalytic community particularly, people were talking about that a lot of, uh, was the relationship between psychosis and small children, autism, autism in children as well, and if this had a relationship. But I definitely think that um, the sort of uh, interception of the, of the screen in between two real-life human faces, as it were, does pose different questions to do with um, the relationship between cognition and the body and of course the ability to mediate your um, actual effect on somebody through that screen and you know again the question of anxiety the question of having that barrier between what you actually look like for example um, and the person on the other side of the screen the fact that we're always mediated through the screen 
means that we always have this medium of control over how th that person um, takes our face. So in that sense, it, it's well met, you know, the interface is a, is a good name for it because it's sort of a midway point between the actual meeting of two real faces. But yeah, there's loads to say about that. It's a really interesting mm. question. Yeah. Can I have one quick question? Really quick, sorry. <laughs> um, can a competition system ever have a face? Do you understand face? Or will it always have an interface? Well, I think, again, I think it's a question of the definitions of the faces, that w how you want to define the face. And that's why I sort of ended with this the idea of different concepts of the face. You know, if we're talking about the evolutionary face, the political face, the aesthetic face because the function of the face is changing and, it, and it's, it's changing even within the, the one human entity that we have now, you know, our own faces, it's, we're, we are these historical um, culminations of these kind of biological evolutionary processes yet overlaid with the symbolic and the aesthetic and all of these other layers of time that are operating within this um, small piece of our bodies. And, and I think that we're having to come to terms with the fact that that, that operation is changing. And, you know, prob probably with our sort of physiological changes as well, the, the concept of the face will change. I mean, if in future we start doing different things with parts of our bodies, who knows what, you know, what, what the, how that will change the face. For example, this whole question of abjection between the fact that you eat and kiss with the same orifice. I mean, in 20 years' time, that might be completely not something that we do anymore. Do you know what I mean? And I'd be like, oh my God, how could people want to do that with that same hole, you know? <laughs> so, who knows? It might, be, it might just be not a thing anymore. Um, does anyone... Uh, you, you had a question. My question is kind of the of yours, so following on from Alistair's question, um, what do you think about Mm. in terms of like humanoid robots and things like this and how the kind of form that that would take in terms of like well obviously the aesthetic face but then also in terms of race uh, voice and the kind of characteristics that we will project onto that mm -hmm. as a means to kind of I mean there are different reasons for it but I don't know it's not so much a question more prompt for me to that. Um, well I think that the the human face is such an incredible and sophisticated and complex um, system and we, we probably take for granted so much of th what it does and how important it is for us to, you know, learning to recognise faces, of course, is um, part of social maturity, but being able to read people's faces, being able to read the tiny micro expressions where somebody's maybe not feeling comfortable, where somebody's uh, being aggressive, where somebody's feeling threatened, you know, all, all of those, those things that make you a sort of good communicator. Um, and, you know, we know that there, is, there are connections between um, people who don't know very well how to operate in social situations and um, autism. And we know that um, the the rejection of the face is not something necessarily neurological it's something to do with not wanting to engage with the other person with the other person's demand and of course you know for example talking about um the sort of rejection of um the understanding of reading human cues um in in, in the question of autistic subjects it's really interesting to look at it from a psychoanalytic point of view because rather than either sort of a, patho a pathologizing discourse that says, you know, autistic people are um, mentally ill or um, any other sort of, sort of derogatory associations, it's rather to do with a particular disposition towards the demand of the other, you know. It's more of a, um, a refusal to have to deal with the, um, all of the other impositions that are necessary by virtue of entering into the social bond. And of course, this is rooted in, in psychoanalytic terms in questions of how the sort of primary caregivers and the immediate um, sort of um, 
um, satisfaction of needs and desires are either thwarted or over um, in overabundance. And this obviously has an immediate uh, relationship to the way that we uh, can build symbolic worlds, that way that we can um, understand other people and the way that we are willing to uh, take in other people's cues. So, of course, this question of um, this sort of diminution of our abilities to understand other humans, if we're only ever dealing with AIs, you know, we enter into this whole problem of, again, the sort of hyper-personalisation, um, the hyper-perfectibility um, that someone was mentioning today about um, that having the, your sexual needs completely mapped out for you. How do you ever go back to reality? How does any, anything ever match up? And so I suppose what that comes down to, again, is this overarching question in, in the world of uh, AI, which is this drive towards complete knowledge, to co towards complete um, understanding of the human uh, being, which we can't have. And what psychoanalysis always tries to do is to remind everybody that there is a fundamental absence, there's a fundamental lack, there's a fundamental gap between you and the other. And you will never be able to fill that gap. And that's precisely what makes communication happen. But it's important to always be sort of um, uh, adept to that and always be able to sort of, um, you know, make your methods of communication as sophisticated as they can be, as opposed to allowing the AI to do it for us. Because yes, it will do it for us. But the danger is, is we become lazy and that we outsource so many of our very, very complex human skills to machines, which in some ways can do them much better than us, but in other ways miss out a whole layer of nuance and sophistication that we have to hold on to. Um, any other questions? Um, maybe, um, so I have like a couple of questions, I guess. Um, and I just wrote this down as, as you were talking then. Um, would when you were talking about, I guess, like the post facial condition, um, do you see that as a um, do you see that as, as a as a condition or, or a state that we are um, we are either in or heading towards, or is it a state? Because I I just wrote down like. Um, that one way to think about this kind of post-facial would be this kind of desire or or drive again for for perfectibility or a kind of totality, um, like a kind of condition that is free from ambiguity and error and all of these things that the face mm. um, either knowingly or not sort of uh, producers and sort of um, uh, yeah so I was just kind of wondering like um, this kind of post facial condition or, or um, yeah I mean is it is it uh, is it an ideal state for certain people or is it something that you can see actually um, emerging or, or, or we are actually kind of heading towards yeah I think I mean I, I'll go back to the sort of sort of ambivalence and the sort of ambiguity of the deleuze Guattari thing about escaping the face and going beyond the face because, you know, they used this example of, of Jesus Christ as the sort of archetypal face but as a sort of oppressive um, idea of sort of um, Western capitalism, you know, that everything began from that moment and, and differing any face that differs in degrees from this archetype uh, sexually or racially or whatever. Um, is, is your sort of index of, um, of um, um, uh, exploitation and prejudice and et cetera, et cetera. And so, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a nice idea, it's an interesting idea, and um, somebody like Barth, who talks about the face of Garbo as, again, being the sort of perfect face that is the archetype of, of beauty, of course, white northern European female beauty, um, and of course, all the inherent problems that come with this notion. But nevertheless, you know, we know that this idea, these white um, heteronormative ideas of beauty exist. We know that this is um, a centre point from which all of our culture revol revolves around, whether it's to um, 
prop that up or to, to um, counteract it. We know that it exists. So I think this sort of question of, of the post face has this sort of double, um, this double quality in, 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 on the one hand, the idea of escaping the face and removing any sort of connection to our um, ordained biological, um, you know, sort of unchosen qualities that sort of give you the, the feeling of, of, of freeing yourself from, of, from nature, you know, the kind of xeno-feminist idea of, hey, change nature, if nature's not good, then we change it. But the problem with that is, of course, we know that that's not really how technology and um, aesthetics work because uh, the people who, for example, now have the ability to change their face and make their face look like anything they want are not changing their face into all different types of things. They're changing their face into a very specific thing. (laughs) Everybody who can change their face or has the money to change their face generally goes towards one type of face. So these these kinds of uh, freedoms often don't take us into any sort of direction which would look very um, emancipatory for many people you know people aren't making themselves you know people are making themselves generally whiter and generally more pornographic if that that's the direction you know if you think that's emancipatory maybe you do you know but the question is it's it's definitely not a wide range of um, of looks that people are going for but again you know it's this question of how far we're talking about the um, the ownership over our identities as being something that can only exist in the aesthetic plane, or whether we're too we're too kind of caught up with the aesthetic plane and we forget that this kind of shields a lot of other very much more dangerous and um, unpleasant things about human nature. And and the fact that you know when when Lacan says beauty is a defence against the real, I think what he probably means is that so much of our aesthetic distractions um, stop us from engaging with real sort of political um, questions of hu- how to arrange human life in a, a sort of fair and equal way because we're so distracted by shiny things basically mm-hmm. by pretty beautiful images and pretty beautiful images will always drive us and will always make us um, follow them but I think certainly if you look at the kind of trend in, in cosmetic surgery at the moment it's quite it's it, it's quite um, un, un, unpleasant and uncanny a lot of the time because you see a lot of people who have started off with a certain distinguished face and they end up looking like a hundred other people exactly the same and you think so is th- this sort of emancipatory thing that you wanted to do for yourself has basically made you into a sort of copy of a thousand other people and and that's that's quite scary actually if you think about what that means for women particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it's an ambivalent question. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I guess the other question I had was, I mean, I guess it kind of links from that. Um, actually, I've got like a couple, well, one of them, okay, so I'll ask the question about um, this kind of post-facial and interfacial mm, mm, issue. I guess like, where do you see something like Musk's notion or like whatever ventures into kind of Neuralink and this kind of um, at least vision, shall we say, what for want of a better word, of where um, brains can sort of uh, seamlessly connect to each other um, without, yeah, I guess in a way sort of like without the face without the mm. need for the face yeah. as a kind of um, means of um, communicating and trans- um, uh, transporting or, um, yeah, like information and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because Neuralink was one of the first things that I was interested in when I wrote the book because, A, you know, someone like Elon Musk who seems to be completely devoid of any understanding of human beings <laughs> <laughs> to, for him to be the person <laughs> driving like this technology, which is, which, which demands such a sophisticated understanding of a the human brain and b human subject and its historical development, that he is then sort of tinkering around with it at this level is ridiculous. And you know, what's um, interesting is that there's always been this fallacy of, of this very masculine fantasy of being able to sort of abstract the brain from the body that you can just 
upload it and make it and make it um, this non-substantial entity, which can then operate in in a in a sort of vacuum. And and you know that's always been a fantasy, but it's a fantasy which has driven much of sort of Silicon Valley ideology, and it still is behind many um, of the technologies that that drive the the, the the economy. Is this idea that somehow intelligence is this singular reified thing that you can take from here and then you can put it here and the first thing that you learn when you do your philosophy a level is that that's not how intelligence works you know and you 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 know that that the idea that these two basic questions that people spend years and years and years writing and thinking about about how the brain is related to subjectivity and consciousness but yet somehow in the world of AI it's just like oh yeah it's the brain you just get the brain put it over here and then do you know what I mean just put, put some wires together and then blah 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 it's you know that it's fantasy ideas and they are um, th- th- it's, it's interesting it's, yes of course there are ways in which we can connect different um, symbolic systems which we obviously do with computers and lots of you know modeling the brain in silico like the blue brain project it's a it's it, you can do it but it takes a very very long time and we we don't even have the resources sort of physical material resources to re- replicate a brain in silico because it would just take too much data too much mm. space um but the fact that they you know they're doing it they're doing it like slice by slice of the brain but people i think it often gets confused with these ideas of the sort of physical representation and replication of a brain and the sort of symbolic um, algorithmic extraction of certain processes of the mind which is you know so symbolic ai is very different in that in that sense from from neuroscience in the way that neuralink operates and i think um, there's so much interesting research to be done there of course with neuroscience is at the heart of it but i think they need to be like in conversation with um, psychoanalysts, with philosophers, with cultural theorists, with political theorists, because they, they can't be separ- these realms can't be separated. You know, the idea that they can and that we can just take parts of human thinking and then put them together with other creatures. You only have to look at sci-fi to see that that doesn't work, that it goes very wrong, and that we end up producing monstrous and horrific things, even though some very interesting things will also come out of it. Um, a lot of sort of terrible mutations happen mm. along the way. I was just reminded, um, y- like weirdly, one of Musk's um, like uh, examples or kind of potential whatever, that he gives when he kind of gives a sales pitch of Neuralink is like the um, ability to uh, share, it's kind of, I mean, fucking weird, whatever, like um, share like um, Great sexual experiences oh with your God. friends. Why? <laughs> Why would like, you? I mean, it's like, okay. Yeah, okay. that's what I was talking my list. <laughs> yeah, I mean. no, that's what we all need. It's like, yeah. I don't know. And then the other thing was like, and I, I, I still to this point, I'm like, uh, apparently with the proposition of Neuralink, is like the, the, um, the protocol that they're using in order to have this thing is Bluetooth. And I'm like, the amount of trouble Bluetooth <laughs> can get you in when you leave it on. And then, I know, I know. Yeah. I was saying, like, I can't even get my fucking phone to connect <laughs> with my Wi Fi speaker. So I don't, <laughs> you know, it's so, um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess the, the, the other question, or final, maybe final question, or final, uh, second to final question, is um, I guess this, I was thinking about when you were talking about. Yeah, I guess it's kind of post facial thing. I was, I, I, in part, I was thinking about Alex's talk um, at the last summit, where she was talking about kind of um, like decoys, and her one of the examples that she gave were, uh, I guess, like NPCs, and sort of, I guess one one would be something like Pinky Doll as an example of it. And I was just thinking in terms of like this rise of, of people and kind of social media who are using things like TikTok or the kind of demands of TikTok um, and there's some sort of discourse around the notion of sort of like I guess like facial I'm um, sorry as words ha- becoming kind of gestures and and again also and the flip side of that would be sort of um, using the face in this particular kind of uh, way which is almost like uh, allowing the subjectivity of the performer to be removed from the acts that they are performing. Does that make sense? So, like, um, I think, to paraphrase or whatever, to 
like this notion of sort of like the NPC um, going about their business, whatever, on Twitch, I'm sorry, uh, on TikTok or whatever, um, and that being this space that actually uh, gives them time to think about something else. Mm. And this kind of almost like a sort of strategic uh, detachment from mm. their performance, mm. both facially and um, semiotically, I guess. Mm. And and then um, that being almost like a mask, as it were. Mm. I was just kind of curious in terms of like, yeah, like your kind of views on things like uh, figures like Pinky Doll who are um, operating in a certain way, which does seem quite um, new to some regard, in relation to their face and and their performance on something like TikTok, etc. Uh, is Pinky Doll the one who does the? Uh, yeah, she I does the. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like. Uh, yeah. Well, do you, you mean what the question of avatars, like what, how far you can... No, I mean, I guess it's more to do with, like, it, it just struck me that someone like her and other M people who are kind of engaging with this kind of NPC kind of characteristics, obviously one way to think of that, which one of the criticisms of that, that kind of approach is that, you know, we're just becoming robots or we're mm -hmm. just... Plumbing. But I think there's also a kind of flip side to that as being that they are strategic uh, ways to behave mm -hmm. in response to the demands of the platform and in doing so you potentially give yourself this kind of like a, a small window where yeah. you can kind of not be so attached to that yeah. as the performer. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. I think that there there are so many ingenious uses of, I mean, particularly at Peter, was brilliant, but the the... The idea that it's just, oh, we're being, ta you know, our human essence is being taken away by this AI. Of course not. Like, I think it's much more important to think about all of the many very clever and um, complex ways that technology can um, change communication and can give rise to different forms of communication that we can then appropriate and engage with. Because of course it's not going away, they, they're, it's only going to get more and more um, sophisticated and you know, there's no point in sort of trying to hold on to this antiquated idea of before that there were, before there was mobile phones, before there was TikTok. Before. And I think that we do that every generation, we get really scared about losing humanness and lo losing our connection to the body and losing. And I just think that this is something that always happens. It's always happened from since the beginning of you know the printing press that we suddenly think that um, symbolic systems are taking something away from this immediacy of our uh, human ability to communicate. And I don't think that's the case. I think that we we are so clever and so smart that we've created all of these symbolic systems that get ever more complex and we find ever more different ways of interacting with them and manipulating them. And of course there are terrible side effects to that and um, they become uh, scarier and more dominating. But those scary and dominating things are the same scary and dominating things that have always been, which is capitalism and inequality and racism and sexism. And those are the things essentially that are the scary monsters. Um, you know, the technology in themselves, they're just extensions of the very very clever things that human brains can do anyway and that human communication systems have always been doing so that people find ingenious ways to to create stuff to perform to interact with their image to interact with other people to hide their images or to, to you know i think those things are all brilliant they're all they should all be um celebrated and and um and explored mm -hmm. um yeah mm -hmm. um really quick Oh, um, well, I think it probably will become more non-binary. That's probably a good thing. Um, but essentially, it will always be the thing that is most consumable and sellable. <laughs> and that will be what we'll aspire to, to look like is what 
we think other people want us to look like. I mean, you know, I think what is great about things like Instagram is that there's always pockets of things that emerge that give you the sense that there is real um, creativity and uniqueness and political movements and that's always the case and but then it always gets crushed but it's, still, it's always there so I think there's a potential for all kinds of interesting things yeah um, maybe then again the last question um, that we've been asking everyone um, yeah I mean like what what is your view on or um, not predictions but, but yeah um, view on the sort of um, impact and um, effects of AI on our bodies and identities in, in the sort of near future where do you think that that um, power or whatever will, will be yeah well I mean this this sort of the topic of my next book really is really like the this sort of the um, paradigm for for governance is one in which we have to think about the ways in which our sort of most intimate forms of enjoyment and suffering are basically always being administered and always um, being worked on by structures that are beyond our control and yes that sounds really scary but on the other hand I think being being aware of it and being able to analyse it and being able to to think of all the really many sort of sophisticated ways in which um, this is operating, you know, it's 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 Baudrillard essentially. It's Baudrillard uh, 2.0, which is all of the things that he was talking about with, to do with this sort of um, acceleration of technology towards a point at which we sort of cross over into this virtual world, which at the time when he was talking about it, people thought was so sort of hyperbolic and ridiculous that nobody thought it was worth listening to. It didn't make any sense. But of course we see now that it's exactly what he was talking about. What, what we're having to deal with is what, what do we do? What is the ontological um, questions and problems that we're now faced with when we do operate in it's a completely different type of of realm than we did in the 20th century um, and this is to do with not just the manipulation of our images but the manipulation of our most intimate feelings and thoughts and sexualities and I was interested about um, the, the talk uh, the previous talk mm -hmm. about um, sexuality which was a very sort of positive and utopian vision of it and I was glad that somebody felt that way about it because I don't feel that way about it at all I think oh god you know the idea that we can sort of map or think about or explo expose our sexuality in this way um, I find horrifying <laughs> but, that, but that's just my personal feeling on it but I I think that it's interesting that something that which is you know the idea of sexuality as being so um, exposed and so open to um, scrutiny for some, and which is which is good, is is a, is a liberating and great thing. But for 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 Baudrillard, he was very interested in the fact that if you take if you look at Foucault's um, trajectory when he was talking about the history of sexuality and the sort of progressive ways in which throughout time we've talked more and more about it to the point that the sort of the discourse is the thing that creates sexuality. Uh, he basically Baudrillard's point was like, well, it will get to the point where sort of the, the discursive scientific sort of um, excision of all of these sort of uh, sexual pr practices comes to a point where sex can no longer exist anymore because it's so explicit, it's so um, untabooed, it's, in, it's so completely out in the open that there is no eroticism, there is no, you know, so pornography just becomes nothing. And in a sense, this sort of crossing over of pornography into being the everyday standard thing that everybody just does, it becomes really odd. You get to a point where it's like, well, what do, what do young people think anymore about sex when it's just pornography is just your everyday dose of normality? So I think there's something that strange happens, and this is not a, this is not a sort of judgmental moralistic question. It's a question of this, of this ontological question: what happens to human subjectivity when the, the sort of realm of taboo is completely flipped over and it becomes this um, part of your everyday life? Something happens, and, and it will change the way that we think about our bodies and the way that we interact with each other. I don't know how, mm -hmm. but it will. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought someone had <laughs> hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh.
Oh, someone sorry. Mm. <laughs> no, I just have one question. Yeah. I really like what you were saying and about the side effects. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about like sexuality and that overexposure to pornography, like what are those side effects that you think this is? Oh the side for like younger generations. Mm. Well, I mean I think you know, to be Puritan and, and, and moralistic about it, yes, I do think that young people watching a lot of pornography is probably not great. Um, but to be sort of, to be philosophical about it, um, I would say that it sort of changes our relationship to, towards lots of things. Um, it changes our relationship to our bodies. It changes our relationship to our feelings about who we are and how we relate to other people. And, you know, if we if if already, you know, probably within the generations in this room represented, um, we, I'm sure we can um, we've had different experiences of what it means to be a teenager um, experiencing sex, uh, having, you know, getting getting coming to terms with the uh, the having to interact with other human bodies. And I'm sure that we've had different experiences depending on our age, whether that was in the 80s, 90s, whatever. Um but but you know that's that's this is changing so much like there's no question that from an age where people were um waiting at home for a telephone call to see you know to 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 see whether somebody liked them or not to now where you can literally watch hardcore porn on your phone at the age of whatever and then as soon as you get to the the age of actually dating you can sort of prescribe exactly the sort of person that you're interested in and you know, anything else will not be will not be tolerated. I think that's pretty depressing, to be honest. I think what it, what it, what it brings in is a certain sort of dampening of um, human experience. And again, I don't want to sound moralistic about it because it's not it's not that at all. But it, this sort of um, removal of this sort of um, gap of anxiety of like me- just meeting another human being and the sort of contingency of that, um, it, you know, it, I think it can be very demoralising. If for a, from a young age you're exposed to some very extreme um, ways of understanding human intimacy, but having said that, I think there is obviously a middle ground, and I do think that um, sex education, people being, you know, women talking to other women about sex, you know, and men learning about how to treat women, you know, all of those things that we know is good for healthy relationships. Um, but it's certainly not that. Um, Everything all at once, everywhere all at once is what we should have. I think that that's probably not a good good recipe for human um, happiness. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>